Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. With me today is Bernhard from Military History Visualized and we are going to talk a little bit about the credibility of archive footage. Now first of all this is definite proof once again that we are not the same person. person and you just said that at the same time now everybody's gonna think it's a conspiracy <laughs> but uh, there we go. So archive footage. Now the reason why we kind of want to talk about this is because well we've had this thing pop up over the last couple of years, a couple of times that people have been bringing up archive footage as sort of not really proof, but showing us, you know, wanting to show us what happened in a certain area. Uh, in some of my videos, I also do use archive footage. It's actually quite an interesting topic because believe it or not, there has to be a lot of scrutiny when you start using archive footage about what you're actually showing and trying to understand the context of what's going on. So I'm gonna hand it over to you for now and we'll get cracking. So generally, I'm, I'm a rather outspoken critic of documentaries. And one of the reasons is because I think the irresponsible use or spam archive footage all over the place. Best example for this is usually that people have the impression of the German Panzerwaffe, the Panzer arm or the, the German army in general in the Second World War, that they were mechanized and so many tanks. The fact is most units were horse drawn. Now, why is this misconception? Basically, the Germans have propaganda companies to film their units and you attach them, well, to your best or best equipped units. So you have see all the half tracks, you see all the tanks, you don't see so much horse drawn artillery guns. Now, I know this already and historians you know this already and actually we fell for this as well. When I got my hands on a manual for the Leicht Infanterie Geschütz 18, the infantry support gun. I looked at it and it had a spoked wheels in, in, the, in the army regulation. And I was like, then I talked with another historian and we were like, okay, maybe this is the mountain version for the mountain troops. And actually, no, this was the regular version. And then another historian at one point actually told me, oh no, those with the rubber tires, which we thought were the original ones, the mm -hmm. correct ones, those were for the motorized division. Mm -hmm. So motorized and of course also mechanized. So we even as historians had the wrong perception that the regular Infanteriegeschütz 18 was with the rubber tires, although this were only for the elite units or the better equipped units as well. And then I actually looked up again in the back now in this army regulation and then I found yeah, a, a description for the motorized units as well. And now we have, we have a, a, a citation and I send it to both historians. So of course, if you would watch film footage, you would only be seeing the one yeah. that is for the, the mechanized troops. I'm, I mean, you can try it out. I, I didn't try this now, but you could search for the Leicht Infanterie Geschütz, yeah. 18. And I'm rather sure the most images you probably will find will be with rubber tires, not with spoked wheels. And I think, I assume, and I don't have the exact numbers, but I assume it should be at least five to one or even one to ten in the, in the amount they were produced for for horse drawn uh, for horse drawn divisions versus motorized yeah. divisions i mean this also goes into the whole question of who made the picture yeah because if a soldier in the field attached to an infantry division or something has a camera takes a couple of snaps uh, that that might be in the family archive he might put that or the family might put that on the internet and those pictures might appear but as you said, you know, the, if it's the, the official film one. Form footage from the official ones, they're going to be very selective of what they bring out because the German, I mean, they had the Wochenschau, which was a re, uh, regular news update from the front lines of what's going on. And you always see a sort of, uh, you know, the, this, this very spectacular footage, you know, Stukas coming down, big guns firing. It's always the same thing. And I, f I think uh, there was once a guy using an MG4, 34 you told me about yeah or 42 yeah, in hip firing hip firing it and so on that's not a lot of discussion again we can talk about anything so it's also a question about rights and then there's a lot of footage that was lost as well that's uh, actually goes into what you were saying about documentaries using the same footage all the time if you look at the footage from the german luftwaffe shooting down american or british planes or soviet planes il2s b17s whatever it's often the same Footage. So one take for each plane or? <laughs> well, it's because the, um, as far as I know, the, where they stored that footage was in Dresden. And then Dresden uh -huh. got bombed and all of that thing, 
Yeah. So there's only very little footage actually left. So actually, I'm gonna check that again because that's what I read in an article at some point. But I have to check that just to be sure. And then there's the other thing of how this footage is shown on. This still goes in also in the problem with pictures. With pictures, you often have a caption underneath saying this happened here. And sometimes you look at it and you then look at the picture a little bit more closely. You're like, this can't happen. So I made a mistake actually once of looking at a downed Heinke 111. I made a video about this. And from just looking at the picture, I was like, this must be a Heinke 111 that was shot down in France. Because if you look at the background, there is a gendarme or a police officer of the, the French police with that quintessential helmet, that French helmet, yeah, that is a little bit of reminiscent of the Adrian helmet. I was like, this must have been in France. And I tried to decipher the number of the, of the bomber and I kind of got close to getting a hang of where it was. And it must have been in France. I'm sh I was sure it was in France. And then I found a picture again on a website in Switzerland claiming that this was a Heinke 111 shot down over Switzerland. I was like, there was a Heinke 111 shot down over Switzerland? You know, I wasn't quite, yeah, there, was a, there were battles and so on, but I can't remember at that point, I didn't remember if there was one down. And I said it in the video, apparently, you know, this is what happened. But my first guess that it was actually in France was correct. So, you know, the, the caption tells you only so much, you really have to look at the picture and decipher it and trying to you know, get an idea. And uh, for uh, so something I saw from a Russian movie, or I, I call it a movie, but it, it was done, it was, I think the, it was a big massive video production made, I believe just after the war uh, in Russia, detailing the whole history of the war. I think it's like an hour long, maybe even, it's a big massive movie. And they have IL-2s landing at what they call Tempelhof in Berlin. You look at the footage, it's not Tempelhof. Now, the narrator says, these are our IL tours landing at Tempelhof, but in the background, there is no city. Tempelhof is right in the city, even back then. There was a big, massive building on one side of it. Yeah, it was the airport in Berlin. Isn't it featured even in Warfinder? Isn't it the Berlin map that you land and start at Tempelhof? Yes. It's around, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so surrounded if you notice, by city. It's, it's basically because there you have the yeah. trouble actually that sometimes you crash when you're damaged. <laughs> exactly. But in the, in the video footage, it's just a field. You know, yes, there is a, is a tarmac, but behind that is just a field and it's like, this can't be Tempelhof. And again, it's, or soldiers just shooting into the never. Why are you not in cover? Why is the cameraman not yeah, in cover? Yeah. Is the camera stand, man standing in the middle of the street while tanks are whizzing past, while bullets are flying, while explosions are going off everywhere? That's one dedicated cameraman right there. I mean, in, yeah. in some cases, I think there were sometimes losses to the propaganda um, company. You, but, but then again, you don't know the losses, how they happened. I mean, yeah. it could be, could be a stray round or, or a mine or something. This would be actually an interesting, this would be an interesting research topic probably. It would be actually, yeah. To how, how much for the different countries or even just one country, the propaganda units, how close they were or how attached they were. In yeah. some cases or not, because I think I saw I saw the grave ones for, for there was something a propaganda unit, in, engravement or a graveyard thing something yeah. along those lines. Then there's the other thing with the First World War, of course, when video photography was just getting going, and I once worked in France for an organization that was doing a lot of commemorations. I started talking with a historian, and in my naivety back then, I said, you know, what what I always find fascinating is how many pictures and how many. Uh, video material there is from the First World War. And he just looks at me and he's like, that was all filmed in the 1920s. <laughs> you know, there is some footage from the actual war, absolutely. I mean, there was uh, recently, there was a revamping of a lot of footage that was uh, filmed by the British, um, which was an amazing sort of recolorization with sound and everything, great stuff. But a lot of the battle scenes with you know, explosions and the people going over the top and running into enemy fire, that is all from movies that were, there's one big movie filmed, I believe, in 1921 um, by France. And, and that's the, and it might give you sort of an impression of how the battle looked like, but it's not the actual yeah. battle. And again, why would a cameraman stand there with his tripod on top of a trench filming these guys as they're getting ready for the attack with explosions going off all around? And then filming these guys going over the top while keeping filming them. I mean, he's on a line of fire. 
he would be shelled to bits if they these yeah, were actually they would, real explosions. They would shoot immediately yeah. because you don't. Yeah, it's not it's like it. you have a big flag saying I'm a cameraman. Press, yeah. you know, press, don't yeah. shoot. And I think they wouldn't care at that point. Yeah, if if they could see it. So yeah, if they could see it in the first place, for them it's just to do it on the you, other you, side. You see yeah. movement or something, and yeah, you open fire usually at that point. I would say. So, f to make one final thing about uh, my channel as well, to bring it back sort of to the footage that I use, when editing my footage, I have to be careful. You know, I have to look at the footage, say, what does this actually show, because the subscriptions on the files that you know I find are not always there, and if. You know, this is also the problem, for example, for me, if I would hand up the editing job to somebody else, I know that if, even if I tell them, like, use this archive footage right here, there's going to be wrong pictures, there's going to be wrong yeah. archive footage. That's not the fault of the editor. It's simply you really need to know what you're looking at. And I still have to find an editor that, you know, knows aircraft to a point where I can just relax and say, okay, this is, this is fine. Um, this is going to go well. So I, I mean, there were a few hiccups. I think in 2019, I think the Canadians showed Wehrmacht uh, soldiers as their own. Then I think for for some presidential candidate or some some U.S. senator or congressman, I think gra congratulated the Navy I mean, with with the picture yes. of, of of a Russian submarine or yeah, something. something. And there was recently with the Battle of the Bulge. I think they showed to commemorate the the Battle of the Bulge. They showed. And an SS soldier um, on the Facebook page. I think yeah, there was something as well. So so yeah, so I mean, mo most often they just had to 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 ask a historian. I mean, they also the Canadians. I think they called the Dieppe raid at the Battle of Dieppe on the commemoration medal, yeah. which is also pretty pretty steep. Yeah, yeah, to go from from a raid to a battle and and make a medal on it. So you yeah. don't ask. I mean. Yeah, I, I sometimes let you check some of my scripts before I put it out, but I don't put it on a metal. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, anyway, um, this goes back to you know, scrutinizing your sources, looking at what you're actually seeing, uh, putting, you know, being devil's advocate. And just because you see something in a foot in footage doesn't mean that it was standardized, yeah. doesn't mean that it was uh, happening in everyday occurrence. Yeah, I mean, this is the best uh, yeah. thing with the hip firing. Yeah, well, so, I mean, so basically, yeah. I, I looked in my video on hip firing because I found, I was quite fascinated when I found in the army regulations that they explained how to hip fire the MG34 yeah. and what, what, what stands to take, and there was a picture and everything. And even actually today, I got a comment again, and he said, I'm surprised you didn't see this video of a guy with the MG42 firing from the hip. Yeah little Rambo there. And I, I, of course, responded, you didn't get the point. Because if you have one scene where this guy fired, you don't know, was it a propaganda company guy? Was it a single instance? Yeah. But there's a complete difference if you have it codified in the army regulations. Of course, this doesn't mean it was standard and was done all the time. But at least the Germans put so much effort into it to put it in codification in the army regulations, which was read by a few hundred, if not thousand people that did the training and everything. Mm. So we know at least it wasn't their plans to do this. Did they actually do it? We don't know this yet. Or we, it's very likely because it shows up again and again in the different books and, and reports. Yeah. So, but, so just one instance in, in that thing doesn't mean something in written form, but we know at least it was planned to do. Whereas one video showing a guy firing an MG from the hip, well, it might have been a stunt for for the for the cameraman yeah. or this guy was particularly strong. Hans, can you show us the old yeah. trick again? Yeah. Because there's I mean there there's footage I think from from one Russian soldier firing the the anti tank rifle, the PTRS or the yeah. PTRD, from the hip like a few times. I think most regular people that try to do this yeah. will have a very bad time. Yeah. Yeah. But and and here's the thing, it was like standardized in, in the armor regulations where they say, okay, they, they demanded this from, from yeah. at least every 10th soldier because that was the Schütze Eins in the, in, the, yeah. in the German squad. So there you go. That's us on archive footage. It's awesome to look at. You can use it absolutely. But look at it just the way you would yeah. look at any other source. Scrutinize it. Be devil's advocate. Ask the questions, even the simple, naive questions. Where was this? Why is this? How is this? Blah, blah, blah. Um, 
and that's where how it goes. Anyway, thanks Bernard for bringing Thank your input. Thank you for having me. And as always guys, have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky. Bye.